Let's come back to Acts 8 verse 40 as the introduction to our comments. And so you remember that when we got to Acts 8 verse 40 at the end, it says, but Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And we looked at that journey, didn't we? That there was a journey we believe that Philip took all the way up the coastal plain, preaching to the cities of Judea. And that in doing so, when Peter later comes through that area, he finds saints in every place. And the evidence was that Philip had traveled ahead of him. And we explained that when he got to Caesarea, that Philip, therefore, in all probability was there. Even when Peter came to baptize Cornelius, Philip was there. But that in the providence of God, it was ordained that Peter should open the door to the Gentiles in baptizing the Japhethite, Cornelius the centurion. And we asked the question at the end of our last study, wouldn't it be nice to know what happened when he got to Caesarea and how his life had unfolded? And as it turns out, there's one of these things that we might describe as a scriptural coincidence. Two Bible passages that call to each other, but don't particularly draw attention to it. It's only when we read them both, we think, oh, there it is, that corroborates that. And so it is, because now, if you come with me to Acts chapter 21, we read these words in verse 8. Acts 21 verse 8, and here's the basis for our study this morning, our concluding study. It says there, concerning the journey of Paul, who's traveling back to Jerusalem to bring the Jerusalem poor fund with him, the record says the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. Now, I think, incidentally, that this is probably not the first time that Paul has been in Caesarea, and most probably with Philip, because he was in Caesarea in Acts 9, verse 30, which is about A.D. 39, and he was in Caesarea in AD 54, which would be Acts 18, verse 22. And now in Acts 21, verse 8, he's here again, and this time it's about AD 58. So this is quite possibly the third time, at least, that Paul has stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist. And that means he didn't just know Philip, he would have known his family, and he would have known his four daughters, whose story is going to be unfolded in this place. So the implication, I think, that we draw is that Philip and Paul are firm friends in the household of faith. But now consider that implication. Paul was complicit in the death of Stephen. And Stephen was Philip's dear friend. How could Philip not have felt such deep distress at the death of his fellow laborer by the hands of this man? And yet here he is in warm association with Paul. It's the Lord, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that says these words, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And there was a spirit in Philip which had accepted the conversion of Paul and rejoiced to now work with him to advance the cause of the truth. What an amazing example of brotherly love and deep forgiveness. That's what Philip was like. Oh, and did you notice how he's described here in Acts 8 verse 40? We entered into the house of Philip. Ah, there it is. Philip the evangelist. So Ephesians 4 verse 11 gives the role of the evangelist. The second of Timothy 4 verse 5 gives us the spirit of the evangelist. But Acts 21 verse 8 gives us the only named example of an evangelist, this man, 
this one with whom we have to do, Philip. It's Philip the evangelist. He's the only brother given that title in Scripture. He's singled out by the Spirit as the living example of what it meant to be an evangelist. And I think the term implies that Caesarea was his base, but that from his home, he's still making circuit tours within his orbit of influence. He's out in Judea, he's out in Samaria, and then he comes back into Caesarea where his house was. He's still an evangelist, right here and now, Philip the evangelist. No such thing as retirement in the truth, brothers and sisters. And then notice what it says, which was one of the seven. So we have been right all along, haven't we? This man is not of the twelve. He's carefully distinguished from Philip the Apostle, and therefore he is indeed the man of Acts 6 verse 5, who's one of the seven appointed by the apostles. But he's also, in an undesigned coincidence, the man of Acts 40 who ends up in Caesarea. We come to Acts 21, and there he is in Caesarea, and he's one of the seven, and he's the evangelist. And so it confirms that this is where this man stopped to establish his home. And now, says verse 9, now we come to our study the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Oh, brothers and sisters, how much interest can be packed into one Bible verse. It was Brother Harry Tennant, I think, who said so long ago that if you take every Bible verse and give it a good pull, you'll suddenly see other Bible passages moving all the way through the Bible. And it's that pulling on Scripture to see what else might be connected that that takes us to golden threads in our Bible studies. Perhaps this is one of them, because there's a question here, you see. So here's the question for Acts 21, verse 9. How was it that the daughters of Philip received the Holy Spirit? Well, it couldn't have been from their father... Because you'll remember that he wasn't able to pass it on. Do you remember Acts 8 verse 16? He couldn't pass it on to the Samaritans because he was of the seven, not the twelve. So even though he possessed the Spirit himself, he couldn't pass it on to his daughters even if he'd like to do so. Now what's interesting about this word prophesy in Acts 21 verse 9, the form of the Greek word is very rare. It's only found in two other places in the Acts of the Apostles. Just come back one page to Acts 19. Here's one of those places. Acts 19 says, maybe reading verses 5 to 7 for connection. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So there's that same word. And all the men were about 12, says verse 7. But this can't be the occasion that Philip's daughters received the Spirit. First of all, it happened in Ephesus, which is not where this family lives. They live in Caesarea. And secondly, this matter only involved 12 men. No women involved. But there is one other occasion much earlier in the record, where that word prophesy, the same man had four daughters which did prophesy, one other occasion where that word's used. Come and have a look at it because, well, I think it's really interesting. Acts chapter 2. Because in Acts chapter 2, we have, well, we have the context for the second use, the only other use of that word. And Acts 2 verse 16 says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. There it is. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So here's the occasion of the outpouring of the spirit on the community of believers. And it was to be, says the record, did you notice an outpouring in the last days? So here it is, you see. And it's Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. In the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And I will pour out in those days, says the record, of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. But do you notice what else is said in those verses? Look at them again. And we suddenly realize that this could have been the moment when the four daughters received their gift because it says, 
I'll pour out my spirit, and your daughters shall prophesy. Same word as Acts 21. My handmaidens, they shall prophesy. Same word as Acts 21. I think this is the moment, brothers and sisters, where these four daughters received their special gift. And apart from Acts 19, where it clearly wasn't the occasion, this is the only other moment when that special word is used. So that when it says in Acts 21 verses 8 and 9, Philip the Evangelist, the same man had four daughters which did prophesy, well, I think that tells us, you see, that since we know that Philip's daughters could not have received the Holy Spirit from their father, and given the similarity of this expression, it's likely that they received it at this outpouring at Pentecost. And I think that tells us something about the four daughters. Because, you see, to receive the gift even then, they must have been godly young women. We know that because the Holy Spirit was never bestowed in an indiscriminate or capricious manner. It was given to those who needed it for some purpose the Father had in mind with them. It was for a purpose intended in the work of the truth. Now, these four girls could not have been given the Spirit unless God had some special work for them in that regard. And if they were old enough at that time, at Pentecost, in Acts 2, to be blessed with Holy Spirit power then they had probably met Christ. These girls had heard the Lord. They'd met him. They'd heard him teach. Now, Acts 2, of course, as you'll know in our margin says, is a quotation from Joel chapter 2. But Joel gives us not only the context of the gift in which these four daughters received the Holy Spirit, but the very time frame in which it might have been exercised by them. Because Joel is going to explain what Peter means when he says, in the last days. So come and have a look at Joel 2 now and see what Joel 2 says with regard to this. In Joel 2, and reading from verse 28... It says this, And it shall come to pass afterward, that's Joel's equivalent of the last days by Peter, by the way, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. So when was this moment to be? When was afterwards to be? Well, Joel tells us in the next two verses. Joel 2 goes on to say, verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, you see. So when was this afflatus of the Spirit to occur? Answer, at the time of the calamities of AD 70. In the age of the overthrow of the Jewish commonwealth, when there would be blood and fire and pillar of smoke, at that time, at that epoch, there would come an outpouring of the Spirit upon the sons and daughters in the events leading up to AD 70. And for what purpose was that Spirit to be given? Because it was always given for specific reasons, and only at certain epochs in time. So why would the sons and daughters receive the Spirit at this particular moment in the history of the world, well, verse 32 says, shall come to pass that whosoever shall call, oh, that's Romans 10, isn't it, from our study yesterday, whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. Now, that verse is quoted in the New Testament with regard to the truth being extended to the Gentiles. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. This is Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The end being AD 70 and the overthrow of the Jewish commonwealth. So Joel gives us the context in which these daughters received their gift. Why were they prophesying? 
because they were involved in the work of gospel proclamation in spreading the truth under spirit inspiration before the events of AD 70 overtook the land and the people of Israel. This gospel shall be preached in all nations and then the end shall come. And these girls had something to do with that work. They were called by God for that work. Now come back to Acts chapter 21. So there's an interesting start to our story, but, well, there's more, you see, because if you come back to Acts 21, verse 9, now read it again, but think about the contextual setting. Acts 21, verse 9, the same man had four daughters, virgins which did prophesy. But here's the thing, you see. Acts 21 is around about AD 58. That's more than 25 years after X2. Now, why do we need to know that they're virgins? Because these virgins are around about 50. And the record is really telling us that they had chosen a single life in the truth service. They were virgins because they had chosen to be virgins. They were virgins because they had chosen not to marry. Do you remember the words of Christ, Matthew 19, verse 12? There be eunuchs that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Well, there were virgins who had made themselves virgins for the kingdom of God's sake. And that's what these daughters had done. They had chosen to become virgins for life. And they are living in the house of Philip, their father, because they're committed to his ministry and they're involved in his labors in evangelizing. And that takes us to the thoughts of Paul who gave instruction concerning virgins. Now, where is that passage, brothers and sisters? Paul's advice on virgins. It's in the first of Corinthians and chapter 7. Come and have a look and see what Paul says because it seems to be highly relevant to the context of Philip's daughters. We're told in the first of Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 25 these words. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Now, I think it's helpful to understand why it was that the apostle gave the advice that he did concerning virgins in the first of Corinthians chapter 7. Because it, at first sight, it seems rather strange. It seems as if he was saying that it was better not to marry at all. But the counsel that he gave in this chapter, we believe, was based on the exceptional circumstances that were about to come upon the ecclesia at this moment of time. Because see, by the time he writes, there's only about 10 years to go until AD 70. And all the calamities of that Jewish age and the end of that age were about to come upon both the Jewish nation and the ecclesia of God. He's writing about a time to come that would be difficult when it came to the matter of marriages. So this is what it says. In the 1st of Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 33, in the advice that he will give, we suggest that the very epoch of the Holy Spirit outpouring upon the sons and daughters, prophesied as we've seen in Joel 2, also was a herald of the coming events of AD 70, soon to fall with calamities. And soon after Paul wrote, the persecutions of Nero would begin and the ecclesia was going to suffer. In fact, they were going to suffer terribly, brothers and sisters, in, in the story of these next few years that were unfold. This age that was about to come brought not only danger for the Jews, but great difficulty for believers. Nero was soon be to begin his persecution against the ecclesia itself. These were dangerous times for saints. And we know that this is the setting for Paul's advice 
This is the setting for what Paul says, that virgins should remain virgins, that they would be better not to commit to the marriage bond because of what he goes on to say. So notice what he does say. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 26, for example. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. But that word distress is the same word that the Lord used in Luke 21 verse 23 when he said, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them which give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land. Same word. And the distress that the apostle has in mind here in verse 26 is the horrors of AD 70 that was going to severely impact young married women and the babes they might bear. Again, notice verse 28. If thou art married, thou hast not sinned. If a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now, that word trouble there, verse 29, is the word flipsis, which, of course, is the word tribulation. It's the very word used two times in the Olivet Prophecy about the tribulation of that period, Matthew 24, verse 21, and verse 29, the tribulation of A.D. 70. This wasn't a comment in verse 29 about the general difficulties of marriage. It's a reference to the unique trials that marriages were going to face in these next few years of turmoil and danger. Again, verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. Young's literal translates that the time henceforth is having been shortened which if you can get your head around, actually sounds quite interesting. The time henceforth is having been shortened. Rotterham says, the opportunity is contracted for what remaineth. You see, marriages during this time would not necessarily run their allotted course. Some of these were going to be cut short in their span by the tragedies of this epoch. Verse 31, he says, the fashion of this world passeth away. The cosmos they belonged to, the cosmos they lived in, was about to be overthrown and vanish away. So let's put all that together and just, just remind ourselves that these phrases, therefore, of Paul's advice to virgins are all based upon the background of that moment in the history of the world, leading up to the overthrow of the Jude Jewish commonwealth. The present distress, verse 26, trouble in the flesh, verse 28, the time is short, verse 29. This world passeth away, verse 31. And I think that all of Paul's advice here was based upon this reality. And his suggestion was that if they did not marry, they would do well. It needs to be seen in that context. He's not rescinding the marriage bond of Genesis chapter 2. So what he says is this. Now read what he does say about virgins in verses 34 and 35. He says, There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and mind. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Now, we shan't turn it up, but I hope you can hear some echoes here, because I think that Paul's comments here are an allusion to an episode in the Lord's life when he gave advice to two certain sisters who shall remain nameless, or maybe they won't. Do you remember the episode in a certain house in Bethany? And of the, one, of the one woman, he says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, Luke 10. And that word careful and troubled, sorry, yeah, careful in, in, in Martha's case, in Luke 10 verse, uh, verse 41, is the same word translated careth here in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 34. It's the, it's the word out of Martha's life. And likewise in verse 35 that you may attend right at the end of the verse upon the Lord without distraction. That word distraction is the same word as Luke 10 verse 40 when it says, but Martha was cumbered about much serving. 
You see, Martha was distracted with too many anxious cares. And the words that Paul uses here take us back to the story of Martha. But there was another woman there, you see, at the same time, wasn't there? There was Mary in that house. And Mary, in contrast, had chosen that better part, which was to sit at Jesus' feet and to hear his word. And I think that, that Paul alludes to Mary's spirit as well, because he says here in verse 35, he said, what I'm seeking that you might do is to attend upon the Lord without distraction. The Revised Standard Version says, to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. But you see that word attend, it means to sit well beside, to sit constantly by. But you see, that's what Mary did. She sat at the feet of Christ as the key to her spiritual dedication. So I think in the, in the advice that the Apostle gives here, it would seem that Philip's virgin daughters had decided to vow a life of total devotion to Christ, to remain single in the truth service, so as best to use their gifts for him. And that the very counsel that Paul gave in this chapter was consistent with actually what Philip's daughters had decided to do. They had decided to wait upon the service of Christ. They had decided to minister to his cause. They had decided to commit to his purpose. They had decided to remain perpetual virgins, being holy in both body and spirit that they might attend upon the Lord without any other distracting cares. And the apostle said, if they're able to do so in this time of present distress and calamities about to come, then they shall do well. So who made that decision, do you think, brothers and sisters? Who made the decision for the daughters to remain virgins? Well, it's very obvious that it had to be the daughters themselves, didn't it? But you see, that, that raises another interesting question. Because come back to Acts chapter 21. Because, well, no, don't come to Acts chapter 21, but let me read it to you. Because there's another echo here now, you see, of another Bible passage that we are drawn to as a consequence. Now, listen to what it says again, Acts 21. Let me just read the words. We entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. The same man had four daughters. You see that connection? We entered into the house, and there's four daughters there. So where are these four daughters, brothers and sisters? They are living in their father's house. Now, where does that take us to in the Old Testament? It takes us in another Bible echo, to Numbers chapter 30. Now come back to Numbers 30 and just ponder the implications of what this must have meant in a certain house in Caesarea on a certain day. In Numbers 30, we have the law of vows, and reading from verses 3 to 5, the law of Moses had this to say about a vow made by a woman. Numbers 30 verse 3 says, If a woman also vow a vow unto Yahweh and bind herself by a bond, and now notice this phrase, being in her father's house, in her youth, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or all her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And Yahweh shall forgive her, because her father disallowed her. Now, wherever they might have been living at the time, brothers and sisters, the day must have come some time after the events of Pentecost and the receiving of the Spirit when four daughters came to a father and said, Father, we want to make vow to commit ourselves to the service of Christ and remain as virgins. And if there was some vow, brothers and sisters, it was theirs. It had to be made entirely of their own free will and volition. That's what made the vow so precious. It was their free will offering to do so. But you, can you imagine now the anguish and the dilemma of Philip? He had to decide 
under the law of Numbers 30, whether to permit his daughter's vow. His own beautiful daughters, never to marry. No grandchildren ever to come. So should he allow their vow to stand? Or should he disallow it? What would you do as a father? Well, he did allow it, didn't he, brothers and sisters? And his daughters were devoted to the Lord for the rest of their life. And now we wonder whether the advice that Paul gave concerning virgins in the first of Corinthians 7 and what was possible in service was based in part on his first-hand knowledge of four very special virgin daughters whom he knew, whom he had met, with whom he had supped before he ever gave counsel concerning virgins. Philip's four daughters might have been the basis for Paul's inspired commentary. And now come back again to Acts chapter 21. And notice something else. It's strange how things are juxtaposed in the divine record. And it's important that we read with care so as to see them. So read that one verse again, Acts 21, verse 9. Same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. If you come over the page, and it cannot be by accident... (coughs) cannot be by accident, brothers and sisters, that in Acts 21 verse 23 it says, do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow upon them. Oh, now that's interesting because here's the story now, I think by way of contrast, in this very same chapter as the Spirit has written it, of the the greatness of these four daughters and their devotion. So what we've got is this. In Acts 21, verse 23, at Jerusalem, there were four men who'd made a vow after the law of Moses to separate unto God in dedication. And their vow is for a limited period of time only. We know that because because they're being told that they're about to complete their vow. It's only for a short time. But in verse 9 of the same chapter, at Caesarea, we have four women who have made a vow under the law of Christ to attend upon the Lord without distraction, and their vow is for the entire period of their life. Same chapter in Acts, brothers and sisters. I think the Spirit intended us to see that, don't you? And so here it is, you see, that the four men represented Israel under the old covenant, seeking fellowship through occasional abstinence. But in Acts 21 verse 9, these four women represented Israel under the new covenant, finding fellowship through continual devotion. These four sisters were a type of the bride of Christ, having given themselves wholly to his service. Now, how did that come about, brothers and sisters? How did all that come about, that marvellous spirit of dedication in these daughters? Where and when and how and why did they discover their passionate, fervent zeal for the things of the truth? Who inspired them? Who was their mentor? Well, the answer, obviously, in the context of Acts 21 was their father. And that's what the record implies, you see. Read it again, Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. Isn't it excellent how repeated readings discloses further details? So here it is, verse 8. The next day, we that were of Paul's company departed, came to Caesarea. We entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, the same man, had four daughters. The same man who'd been an evangelist to others had also been an evangelist to his own household. That man, 
He was the one who had these four daughters. And this is something we should never forget to do, brothers and sisters. No matter what other ecclesial responsibilities or ecclesial labors or ecclesial burdens lie upon us, we who are fathers, we who are mothers, must never forget to evangelize our own household. Philip had done this, and he'd done it extremely well. He was the fruitful teacher of children. It was it the spirit of Abraham, really? Do you remember Genesis 18, verse 19? I know him, says God, that he will command his children and his household after, after him, and they shall keep the way of Yahweh. It reminds us of Psalm 144, verse 12, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth and that our daughters may be as cornerstones cut for the structure of a palace, says the Revised Standard Version. And so notwithstanding his own labors in the field of evangelism, Philip had been an evangelist to his own household and his preaching had obviously been successful because as a result of his fatherly advice and his counsel, his daughters were shaped like a holy temple and an habitation of God through the Spirit. What lovely girls they must have been. Now, brothers and sisters, daughters of today on devices every day are not being prepared as an habitation of God through the Spirit. And neither are sons. Shaping daughters for the similitude of a palace is a work mainly performed at home. Bible schools and ecclesias might add a little polish, but they're not cut to shape there. That's a work for home. And parents, especially of young daughters, ought not to underestimate the power of technology to rob their daughters of their spiritual destiny. Philip knew what to do, and he was blessed to have such a household, blessed to have such daughters. But don't you think that in turn they were blessed to have such a father? A man who was able to nourish the, the special resource of spiritually gifted daughters. I don't think all men would have allowed their vow to stand, but this father did. He knew how to encourage and guide his girls into the wise and proper use of their gifts, to find the secret of fulfillment in their lives through their very labors in the truth. In his home, he had a Sarah and a Deborah and a Hannah and a Holder. Within his household, he had a Mary and a Priscilla and a Phoebe and a Lydda, and he loved them, loved them all. And he knew how to handle their blessing and such a way that their special talents were focused in the truth. By the time we come to Acts chapter 21, they've been faithful for 20 years or longer, this household. That's a long time to test the faith of a family. And now these daughters, who are so much older in Acts 21, have proved the strength and the thoroughness of their father's teaching. Her own convictions, their own convictions are as strong as their dad's. Of course, it's interesting that at this moment of time, if you think about it, there must have been many other daughters of believers in those days who did marry and who did bear children, and yet we know nothing about them. But these girls who never had children, who never had a family, it's as if God said, I shall record the story of these four, that their spirit of dedication might never be lost. It's a strange thing, you know, but I think that the story of these four daughters is connected with an Old Testament family whose destiny also revolved around a cluster of daughters. Now, come and have a look at Genesis chapter 49 in the promise or the blessing of Jacob to his sons. Jacob, in blessing his sons at the end of his life, had this to say about Joseph. Genesis 49, verse 22 says, Joseph is a fruitful bower, 
even a fruitful bear by a well whose branches run over the wall. But that word branches there is the Hebrew banot, which is from the Hebrew bat, which is the word for daughter. And the margin's correct, whose daughters run over the well. So, so you see, over the wall. So Joseph had such fruitful daughters that they would spring beyond where they had come from. And you know there was a fulfillment of this prophecy in the tribe of Joseph when they came to receive their inheritance in the land. Uh, incidentally, on the west side of Jordan, I might add. Because you see, if you come to Joshua 17, we find that, that one of the sons, one of the six sons of the male offspring of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, was in fact the man called Zelophehad. Now, notice what it says of him. Verse 2 of Joshua 17, there was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh by their families. The children of Abiezer, Helik, Azrael, Shechem, Hefer, Shemida. These were the male children uh, of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their families. But Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, so notice, he's of the children of Hefer from the previous verse, but he had no sons. He did have daughters, he had five of them. The names of his daughters were Mala and Noah and Hogla and Milka and Tietzer. And so he had five daughters. And what happens is that when those households, when those six families received their portions, they ended up with ten portions. Now, how do six families end up with ten portions? Well, because five families ended up with a portion each. But one family line, the line of Hefer, ended up with five daughters all giving a separate portion, every single one of them. So Zelophehad was given a parcel of land for each and every one of his daughters, as it says in verse 6, because the daughters of Manasseh, which we should read as the daughters of Zelophehad, had an inheritance among his sons. So they were counted through the line of Hefer, these daughters, remarkable daughters, a whole story of which we cannot now speak particularly. But you'd never guess where they settled those five daughters. They headed off towards the coast and settled in the region which afterward would come to be known as Caesarea. Five daughters who married who were all famous in the region and now there will be four daughters, every one of whom will never marry, but they will be famous in this same locality for their faithful desire to claim their spiritual inheritance in the kingdom. Same place, brothers and sisters, interesting. The five daughters of Zelophehad in the Old Testament and the five, the four daughters of Philip in the New. And there would be many in the region of Caesarea who could testify to the faithful spirit of the four daughters of Philip the Evangelist. And wasn't their example a wonderful proof of the good work of Philip himself? Because think about what we've really seen in our studies concerning Philip. You see... He was the perceptive helper of others, a gracious provider for deprived and neglected widows that they might know the blessing of loving care. This is the man who's the joyful preacher to despised and hated Samaritans that they might receive the gift of saving truth. This is the man who's the willing baptizer of an outcast and lonely eunuch that he might discover the peace of fellowship joy. This is the man who was the warm encourager of gifted but single daughters that they might find the secret of spiritual fulfillment. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, Philip was a good man, was he not? And in all that he did, he showed the spirit of his Lord because the Lord was the one who reached out to tell and to touch, to teach, to forgive, to restore, to bless. A man who moved his disciple, this Philip, to become the perceptive helper of others and who has inspired his daughters to such heights of devotion that their lives were incensed into a perpetual fragrance unto God. Let's be grateful that another Bible school has given us time to be refreshed together in the things of the truth. And let's be thankful for the example of Philip, the evangelist, who showed such 
warmth and care and compassion that we might learn to go and do likewise.